Hey everybody, I'm Austin Lieberman. Welcome to my channel. I'm the founder of austin.substack.com. That's my email newsletter where I focus on teaching normal people like me how to become long-term investors and grow wealth without staring at and stressing over the stock market or over crypto every single day. Uh, through this YouTube channel, I will share my journey of sharing, of growing a real $10,000 portfolio. It's $10,000 of my family's own money uh, to $1 million with 100% transparency. That means uh, every transaction I'm going to share, I'm going to uh, track the performance and show you how the portfolio performs over time and even compare it to the S&P 500, the NASDAQ, you know, the market. Um, and I'm going to do that. That that verification is going to be through common stock, which I'll share how that works in a minute so that anybody can see it publicly at any time. Um, I'll also share stock analysis and how I think about research and big news items on the companies I'm invested in um, that I think need to be shared, not daily news. That's just random noise. Nobody needs any, any more of that. There's enough of that out there. If you're into that, I'd really appreciate it if you take a second and uh, like this video right now down below and then subscribe to this channel. That does two things. Make sure you never miss a portfolio update like the one I'm sharing today um, or any of my stock research, which I think you'll enjoy and hopefully find value from. And um, not that I want anybody to follow what I do directly. This is not advice. I'm not a financial advisor, but I do want to help people understand uh, a way that you can actually do some research on stocks as a normal person versus some of the things that we've seen over the years where uh, over the last year or so where people are kind of just jumping into things that are moving with momentum or that neighbors are talking about or whatever. Um, we can get really hurt by doing that. Um, it also helps this 100% transparent channel rise above the noise. Some of that stuff that I just talked about that I'm not a big fan of those pumpers and dumpers um, and cat meme videos, right? So other people can find this and, and hopefully find value in it and learn from it. In today's video, uh, I'm going to share exactly what stocks I own in a the $17,000 portfolio. It's grown um, from $10,000 to $17,000 through my own contributions. Plus, um, the portfolio has uh, grown by five to eight uh, percent on its own. So, I'm going to tell you what I own in that portfolio, how I plan to grow it from you know the $10,000 at the start to a million dollars. Um, an update on what I think about the overall stock market and the valuation of the stocks currently in my portfolio. And then a preview of a few of the stocks that uh, I'm considering buying when my uh, $1,500 contribution hits the account on April 1st. Um, I've got $1,500 that comes in on the 1st and $1,500 that comes in on the 16th of every month. And that's what I'll be investing into this account. And then uh, Occasionally, I might add an extra 1500 here or there if, if we've got that to add, just kind of like a normal person building a portfolio. Um, just a, a quick heads up, the newsletter subscribers at austin.substack.com, they uh, will get the exact stocks that I'm going to buy on the 1st um, and my reasons for buying them on Wednesday, March 30th. So that's two days before I buy them. And the purpose for that is... Um, I want to provide that transparency and just give people a heads up as to what I'm going to be buying before I actually buy it so that I'm not buying into something and then um, writing an email about it and after I already own um, that position. So I'm sharing it before I buy what I'm going to buy. Um, got to get going because I'm not sure how long this camera is going to last. It's running on battery. I got to get, a, I got to get this thing plugged in. Um, all right, let's get started. So remember, not financial advice. I'm just a guy on the internet. Um, and this is for informational purposes only. You might hear a lawnmower outside. Every time I start recording, um, there's a newscast sent out to the, the maintenance crews and they, they come start cutting the, the lawns. So um, might be a coincidence, but it happens far too often for it to be coincidence. So somebody's out to get me. Um, all right, what's in the portfolio? We're gonna do a screen share. And here we go. You should be able to see my screen. This is uh, my newsletter, austin.substack.com. And just to show you, um, you know, I write things on here ahead of time just because it's easier than recording a, a video. So if you want the things first, essentially subscribe to the newsletter. There is a paid option, but there's a, a free version too. It explains who gets what um, transparently. So check it out if you're interested in it. All right, here we are, 2032 portfolio. 
that's key number one. So how I'm going to grow this $10,000 into a million dollars is uh, not overnight. It's with time. So we're setting this up as a 10 year portfolio. Um, and again, contributing $1,500 every two weeks, um, sometimes more. Uh, this is a long-term oriented portfolio. So I want to hold positions for years and even add to them the winners over time. And that kind of is counterintuitive. A lot of people uh, are common, common knowledge out there might be that uh, we want to, we, we don't want to buy more of stocks. If they go up, we want to think about when to sell them if they go up. Um, that's not how I like to invest because a, a lot of times if you're invested in great companies, great companies do well and you benefit from adding more to them over time. So I'm not just going to talk about that. I'm going to show that as I share my investments uh, over time in this in this channel. Um, not trying to time the market based on macro or economic um, guesses or predictions as people like to call them, although it's very hard to predict what's going to happen in the economy. And even if you can, most it's impossible to know how the stock market is going to react. And if those things that people think are going to happen are already priced into the stock market or the market's going to react. So take all that out. And if I'm going to be invested for 10 plus years, I don't care about that. I'm going to focus on buying the best companies that I can find and, and some of the best crypto assets that I can find, which I'll get into a little bit. Um, not pumping crypto here. There's a way that uh, I plan to do it in this public portfolio that doesn't require all the craziness of wallets and getting hacked potentially and all that stuff. There's people that do that. Great. I'm not saying you can't do that, uh, but that's not what I'm going to, how I'm going to invest in crypto through this, this public market portfolio. There's things called uh, crypto ETFs that I plan to own for that um, exposure to crypto in this basically stock market portfolio. Um, big thing for me is I only invest money that I don't need for at least five years. So I'm not trying to uh, double this overnight to then go use this money to do something. Uh, in my experience, that's not a safe or smart way to invest. And that's not how I invest. I invest money that I don't intend to use for at least five years. And the name of this portfolio is 2032. So that's 10 years from now. Um, and yep, I'll own a mix of growth stocks, crypto ETFs, and dividend growth stocks, which I'm excited to talk about. And it's not something I've done historically, if you follow me. Um, all right, so let's jump into it. So first of all, before I get into the portfolio, that's a bold claim, right? I'm going to I'm gonna grow this from $10,000 into a million dollars uh, in just 10 years, right? So let's look at this. Um, I did this amount because this is what it was at. The portfolio is a little bit different than that um, right now, but $17,000 basically, 10 years to save a 10% rate of return and $3,000 contributions a month. Um, that gets to $650,000 after 10 years. So wait a second, I'm not hitting that that t uh, million dollar goal. How are we gonna do it? Well, there's a couple, a couple ways, right? You either have to try to get a better return, which is um, harder to do and potentially makes you bring on more risk, which could end up making the whole plan fail, but let's show how that could work and what we need to do if we're if we're just basing it off of the three thousand dollars a month. Which, if you have that to invest, awesome. If you don't, that's awesome too. Start with where you're at. I started with much much less than that. Um, a, a goal of mine at first when I started was five percent of my income, and as we uh, managed our finances and met some of our financial goals, um, made more money as a family, got promotions and things like that. Uh, I bumped, we bumped that up to 10%, 15%, 20%, um, and even as high as 30% of our income. And again, not everybody's there. You don't have to be, um, I started with much less and it, it's important to just get started because time is your friend and I'll show that with this calculator. Okay, so we started with 10%, right? Let's see what happens at 15% annually return. So that's making 15% on average every year. Uh, estimated total after 10 years, 858,000. 17%, 961,000. Okay, that's what I would need to do to grow $17,000 to $1 million after 10 years, 18%. Uh, if you've studied or followed the market or maybe you've heard the market averages about eight to 9% per year. So 18%, I'm trying to, uh, Try and be trying to double what the stock market on average has done 
um, about over the past hundred years, which is pretty hard to do. And that puts you uh, up there with some of the greatest investors of all time if, if you can earn those returns. So uh, I'm not going to rely on that. Right now I'm doing um, $3,000 a month, but a major shortcut, let's bring this back down to 10%, 649000 if we're doing 3000 a month. If over time I can bump that up and then over the 10 years I average $4,000 a month, then that turns it at 10% into $850,000. If I could average 5000 a month, which is a lot, but it's a kind of a cool goal and the benefit of doing that is uh, as you're investing more, you're probably managing your budget and living below your means, which gives you a buffer between your expenses and your lifestyle and your income and your budget. So it helps be better prepared for emergencies and different things. Uh, it's That's a lot of money to save every month and I'm not even sure that we, we can do it. But uh, we're gonna try and, and the reason is, is because just by doing that, by increasing the amount per month, that means you have to have less returns to get to your million dollar goal, right? And so maybe it lands somewhere in the middle. Maybe it's $4,000 a month on average over time, so not starting right now, but eventually. And the rate of return is 12%. Well, there you go, 950,000 or 13%. There, bam, we hit it. 13% uh, rate of return, $4,000 a month is a way to get to a million dollars over 10 years. It's an ambitious goal. I don't know if we're gonna get there with it, but that's the goal. And instead of taking on more risk or doing crazy risky things, the way I would try to accelerate that is by saving more and investing more. And that's a theme that I want to try to share through this channel. It could be cool to save more money. It doesn't have to just be uh, these crazy investments that we see some people making or gambles or, or whatever because uh, most people by the statistics that try that stuff, it doesn't work out very well. All right, how am I going to track this stuff? Uh, commonstock.com and full disclosure, I am an employee of commonstock.com. This is my opinion, not common stocks, but I'm proud to work at the company and I love the platform, which is why I asked the founder and CEO and the team if I could join and applied um, because I love the transparency and the community that they're trying to build in that I get to say we, that we are trying to build at Common Stock. Um, this is what it looks like. So I've got my portfolio connected securely to where it is tracked publicly on Common Stock. And because of the broker I use, M1, um, some of this return data is a little bit slow to populate. So you may see it off from, the, uh, from M1, which is the brokerage, by a couple percent here or there. That'll work itself out over time. And honestly, I'm not worried about um, a, a 1% or 3% difference. The point is the transparency and that it's public and people can see it. I'll share that link in the comment, uh, in the comments so people can go, but it's commonstock.com forward slash Austin. Anyways, you can see the, the returns and it even shows against the S&P 500, um, the NASDAQ and different things, pretty cool. But what it also does, and this is what I talked about, I'm gonna show you exactly what stocks I own in the portfolio. And again, you'll see these percentages up here. 9% is, is GitLab. That's a pretty large position if you're talking about a, uh, a portfolio that you're not adding to. But because this is a new portfolio and because I'm gonna build it with 10 years of contributions still, 10% uh, or, or even a 20% position would not be a large position in this portfolio when you think about all the money that's gonna come into it over time. But, um, Right now, the largest position is GitLab at 9%. And I'll, I'll probably go over the, the next 10 positions. Um, Monday.com is a, about an 8% position. Uh, ticker is MNDY. Twilio, eight, about 8%. DigitalOcean, 7.5%. Snowflake um, is about 6%. ServiceNow is between 5 and 6%. Upstart, about 5%. Shopify, about 4%. Mercado Libre, about 4%. Coinbase, 4%. The Trade Desk, uh, 4%, HubSpot, 3.7%, Datadog, 3.7%. Anyways, they're all there. Uh, down to the dividend side, and, and you could see all of these, again, at commonstock.com, and you could see them on the screen as well. Let's talk about some of the dividend stocks, which are a smaller portion of the portfolio. Um, reason for that is because I, I um, think a lot of the growth and 
software as a service or cloud stocks that you see in my portfolio are uh, they've sold off a lot, but not just that they've sold off a lot, but compared to the growth that um, analysts and even the companies are um, guiding to over the next year to two to three years, uh, it's a pretty good opportunity, in my opinion, to be owning those stocks, which is represented by them being a larger part of the portfolio. Um, but anyways, the dividend stocks that I own, Fidelity National Financial, MasterCard, Broadcom, AbV, Advanced Auto Parts, Amgen, 3M, Raytheon Technologies, and American Tower, uh, as well as Lowe's. So um, we've, we've shown the, the companies that are in the portfolio. Now I want to talk about um, kind of just how I think about the market and uh, I don't try to time the market. I don't try to guess if the stock market's going to go up or down, but I like to be aware of the valuation of the market and if things are you know, very expensive in terms of uh, price to earning multiples, which if you want um, videos on things like price to earnings multiples, price to sales multiples, uh, different things like that and it broken down simply so people can understand them, uh, let me know in the comments and, and let me know what you'd like me to cover and I'm, I'm happy to cover more. Uh, but anyways, I don't try to guess what's going to happen in the market day to day based on what's going on in the world. Um, even when scary things happen, like you know the very unfortunate conflict and invasion of Ukraine by Russia, which is just a horrible and unfortunate thing that's going on, um, I try to separate my investments, which I've decided that I'm going to add to my portfolio every month and be an investor for the next 10 years, but actually I want to be an investor for the next 30 years. That's the the long-term game, if you will, that I've decided I'm going to play. If I'm going to play that game, the best thing I can do is stick to that plan and add money over time, in my opinion, then try to guess whether the market's going to go up or down because um, I've tried to do that before and, and and there's a lot of data out there that shows when people try to do that, it generally doesn't work. Um, and you've probably heard the saying, time in the market is better than timing the market. And so that's what I'm shooting for is spending my time just accepting that I'm going to be buying stocks over time. And if you, people don't want to do individual stocks, then index funds or ETFs are a way to accomplish this without even having to think about um, individual stocks like I am, which is a lot less time, even the way I do it is less time consuming than somebody day trading, but still it takes time. So uh, this isn't the only way, perfectly acceptable to buy some type of S&P 500 index fund or, or uh, the QQQ and own the NASDAQ, you know, these different things, which um, I don't want to overcomplicate it, but uh, people can own indexes in their 401k or just own the total stock market and uh, do well over time by just adding and holding over their career. Um, the, the people that try to time in and out, generally, uh, it's really hard to do. And, and it, it usually they destroy wealth that way because um, our human nature works against us when we're trying to do that. Um, so anyways, this is the S&P 500. And what this chart shows, this blue line, is the normal multiple or PE ratio that it's traded at on average over time. The orange line underneath it is what would be considered fair value or, or a, a PE ratio of 15, which is is just what fast graphs would consider to be the fair value based on how earnings have grown from the companies in the S&P 500 index over time. So the big thing there is uh, the price to earnings multiple is, is a way that um, valuation can be measured based off the earnings that companies bring in and their stock price. Um, and this this blue line is what it has traded at on average over time. And the orange line would be a price to earnings ratio of 15. So we see right now that the blended price to earnings ratio is about 22. And over time, over history, it's traded at 18. So right there immediately, we see that it looks like the S&P uh, 500 is a little bit overvalued compared to its entire history. But what if we go back um, 14 years or about 10 years versus uh, versus uh, 20 years? So um, right now, then it's showing the normalized price earnings ratio is 17. And so if we shorten that, it gets to 19. 
if we shorten it even more, it gets to 20. So what this is telling us is that in recent years, it's traded at a higher price to earnings multiple than it did uh, over, uh, over the longer time frame. Now things have gone a little bit crazy. This, all of this right here past this line is since COVID. And we know how crazy the stock market got after COVID, right? So one of the things I like to do is take this out, take COVID out and see the 14 years. Um, and, and that this, so if you go back this far, it includes 2008. So let's get, let's get the craziness out of here, right? Let's get 2008 out of here as well. Cause 2008 was the great financial crisis. And so now we're looking at like kind of a normalized period of 2010 through 2019. And, and people will argue that the S&P 500 was overvalued through that whole time. I'm not here to make that argument or not. But what I'm here to show is that during that time, which was a good time for the S&P 500, uh, it traded at a normalized PE ratio of 17. So no matter what anybody is, is what argument anybody is trying to make, just based on history right now, the S&P 500 is trading over its historical price earnings multiple. That doesn't mean I'm not in investing in stocks. It, it does mean, I mean, this is one of the reasons I like investing in individual stocks. A, because it interests me and I have the time to look at them. Uh, but B is because I can pick and choose the stocks that I want to own that I think offer the best uh, potential based on their current valuation, sales growth, earning growth, and dividend, things like that, I can pick and choose those and not own all 500 of those companies um, by just owning an, an S&P 500 index fund because I do think the S&P 500, if we just look at this, is overvalued. And so back to here, this is, this is what I like about this Fast Graphs tool. Um, it's not an advertisement. I pay for this product. I, I get nothing from, from sharing that. If we go out to here and we go back to its normalized, you know, uh, price to earnings multiple through 2023, we're looking at a the the S&P 500 would actually be down four percent from here if it trades back to its normalized multiple. And so what that tells me is like even with the expected earnings growth right now, it the S&P 500 is a little bit overvalued. Um, now, things could change. These numbers, the, the companies in the S&P 500 could have better earnings than expected. And if that's the case, then these lines right here go up. And that's where the potential for you know outperforming could come from. But um, I'm not confident that that's going to happen. And I like to go off of kind of what analysts are expecting just because uh, it's, it's a, a, you got to go off of something. And that's, that's a decent place to reference from because we can we can measure it it gets it's it gets added to these where they pull this data from which is fact set and it's what we can measure it's the only thing that we can measure and then from there that's kind of our baseline right and then we could think okay maybe they do better maybe they do worse and that's what helps you think okay well the opportunity could be a little bit better or a little bit worse and, and that's how we can make our decision none of this stuff is precise and if you think it's precise um it could lead to a lot of mistakes it's called it's called false precision where you think the accurate uh, the date is 100% accurate but but that could lead to some bad things too um, so anyways that's the S&P 500 and um, let's take a look at some of the the dividend stocks that I um, am considering adding to on uh, April 1st again I'm gonna I'm gonna per, I'm gonna tell my newsletter subscribers austin.substack.com exactly what I'm buying on Wednesday March 30th two days before I actually buy it on the first. But this is just where I think the valuations are in, in some of the companies. And I'm just gonna kind of run through these pretty quick. But basically what we're looking for is if this black line is below the blue and orange line, that means that, that I'm interested in that, in that company to potentially uh, add more of in my portfolio because it looks like um, there's upside opportunity there. And we'll, I'll show you how exactly how that could work. Um, all right, advanced auto parts. So right here, uh, already it's it's different from the entire s p 500 because it's trading below its historical range um and and even and i like to go down to fair value over time because i like to be conservative but even down to this fair value with the if you notice the earnings here are estimated to grow faster than the s p 500 the s p 500 was like one percent and nine percent 
estimated to grow at 14 and 15. Just estimations. Done. It could be off. But even back, even down to the price rate uh, earnings ratio of 15, we're looking at an annualized uh, return through 12/31/2023 of 8 percent. That's a lot better than that minus 4 percent that we were looking at um, from the S&P 500 potentially. Um, so advanced auto parts, that's that's what we're looking at there. AbV, and we didn't even talk about the the dividend yield, uh, 2.78 percent for advanced auto parts. And again, these are companies that I own, not just random companies I'm, I'm talking about because I need companies to talk about. Uh, it has, over the last 12 years, um, it's it's returned 15% a year. I don't know why it's showing negative for the SP 500 year. Um, that's off, but uh, anyways, it's been a pretty good returner for the last 15 years, according to this data in Fast Graphs. Um, and the uh, compound growth rate for the dividend has been 24% over 12 years. But really, they paid a 24 cent dividend, um, and then they just bumped it up big time in 2020 and 2021. So that's why I like um, Advanced Auto as a as a dividend growth company in my portfolio, and I actually own it. AbV, we'll we'll move through these a little quicker now that I ex- kind of explained what the um, black and orange lines are. AbV 3.5% dividend yield from its current price to its normalized PE ratio. We're looking at a 1.7% annualized return based on the current growth expectations. And so right now, um, AbV is is about a 1.7% position. It's not on my list of you know top things to add to. Kind of just based off of that. Um, but if we go to this forecasting here and we look out a little further, then you know through 2024, it actually does look kind of attractive. Um, but for the time being, I'm, I'm not really uh, looking at buying more AVI just because it hasn't really sold off as much as some of the other stuff. Um, it does pay a really nice dividend yield. And then over time, it's, it's really done well compared to the SP 500 up 20% versus up 14%. I don't own Allstate. This is just in here for tracking purposes. Amgen, Amgen's another one. So we got to start moving quicker. Uh, but a nine percent annualized return if it gets to uh, its its normal price to rate, earnings ratio um, from about the last you know twelve or so years, which is actually below its fair value estimate. So um, Amgen is pretty interesting to me right now. Uh, Mayor Price Financial. I don't own this one, but I I do plan to buy it um, soon. It's it's like on the at the top of my watch list because. Uh, if it gets to its normalized price earnings ratio, uh, you're looking at about a 12% return. And if it gets to the price earnings times growth rate, which is the average earnings growth rate, then you're looking at an even better return. I'm not optimistic it's going to get up there because it hasn't really traded there in the past. And this is how easy this this fast crash tool is to use. And again, this is just for reference. We also have to do research on these stocks, but just sharing this stuff for reference. Um, it, it normally trades around this this blue line, right? So safer to think here is more likely than up here. American Tower, um, American Tower, they, it doesn't really trade off um, operating earnings. It trades off um, free cash flow, but I'm uh, not going to go into it. It's not on the top of my list to be adding more to right now, but I do own it in the portfolio. Um, and then Broadcom. So... Broadcom, if it trades at its normalized PE ratio, is actually um, you know, not looking like a great opportunity through 2023, um, just based off of, again, earnings estimates. It does pay a nice dividend. Uh, it, it has been a market beater over the last 12 years, 36% to uh, 13% um, when compared to the S&P 500. So it's got a good history, a good track record. You'll notice that in the companies that I own, that they beat the S&P 500 over time. I don't own Best Buy. I'm a little bit worried about owning Best Buy right now with um, rising rates and the supply chain stuff, um, but it, it does pay a nice dividend yield. And um, you know, according to these estimates, it does offer a good return potential. But again, there's reasons beyond just looking at these charts as to why to own and not own stocks. Um, a lot of it has to be our preference, what we're comfortable with, research we've done. And Best Buy is a company that I, I just am not comfortable owning right now in the current environment that we're in. 
Uh, but over time, I'm, I might get more interested in, in um, purchase shares. Bristol Myers, don't own it, but um, looking at it, and so there's something going on here with Bristol Myers, like that. That if a, a stock is trading that far below kind of its historical averages, usually that means something negative has happened with the company, and and even though this looks like an amazing opportunity, I need to do more research to learn about why it's trading at such a discount to its historical averages. Um, because sometimes we could be deceived by the opportunity here and there's really something going on underneath. So um, it's definitely on my list because of that that potential, like even just back to um, the uh, a 15 price earnings ratio over the next three years, you're looking at a 37% annualized return. If we go to forecasting, um, even if it, so right now it's trading at nine, if it stays at nine through 2024, you're looking at a 5% annualized return. So there might be, this might be a good opportunity. Um, but if we look at, so something's off with their, I don't know what's going on with fast graphs today. Maybe it's just not updated because it's early in the morning or something. Um, everything is, is the SP 500 is being funky. The, uh, with, with the comparisons here. So not sure. Um, but for today we'll go off these. It's showing an 11% return. Uh, on average since um, 2010. Cigna, another one that's at the top of my list to be buying soon. Um, got a 15% annualized return from now to 2023. If it trades from a, it's at a PE of 11.6. If it trades up to 12, um, given its growth, it's 11% or 10% or and 12% growth expectations uh, earnings growth expectations for the next two years, trading at a dividend yield of 1.8%. And I haven't said this yet, but this right here shows the dividend payout ratio. Dividend payout ratio um, of earnings, which is about 18%. And so this green line represents earnings, the uh, the company's earnings. So to here, these are estimated. This, this green line shows the actual earnings. And so what you want to see is this down here. So it's at about 20% just shows that their earnings can easily cover uh, the dividend. And so that's good, especially we don't want companies to cut dividend. We, we would ideally like them to keep growing dividends. And um, as somebody with a long-term time horizon, I generally, if I own a dividend stock, I want it to be one that is expected to grow its dividend over time. Um, and they really just actually started um, paying an, you know, an actual significant dividend. And so these numbers are off, but don't, so this, these dividend growth numbers are off, but but they just institute a, a four dollar dividend per share. Comcast don't own it, so I'm not going to talk about it. Cummins don't own it. John Deere don't own it. Um, I would have loved to get some, even if it was down kind of near fair value, just because um, how important I think this company is, especially when we think about agriculture and what's happening. Coffee break. Um, but right now. It's, it's jumped way back up here. And when you when we look at it, whoops. When we look at kind of that opportunity, it's not a great opportunity, um, but they could crush earnings and, and or it just could keep going higher. But again, I don't like to invest off of hope. I made that mistake before, don't wanna make it anymore. Discover Financial, don't own it. Um, DR Horton, don't own it. First American Financial. Don't own it. Fidelity National, I own it. Um, it looks like an amazing return opportunity. They're very exposed to mortgages, and so um, I, I own it kind of as exposure to housing industry, but because of what's happening with rates, I'm, it's even though the return potential looks amazing, even if it just gets back to its normalized price earnings ratio, I'm gonna let the stock do what it does. I'm, I'm not um, adding more right now just because I wanna kind of see what happens with the, the housing industry and, and the mortgage industry because um, it could have some, some pretty serious risk as well. So uh, happy with the position I have, not selling it, but it's not, even though it looks like an amazing opportunity, not at uh, the top of my buy list. Uh, Johnson Outdoors don't own it, but um, it's interesting, uh, obviously because of marine and, and, and boating and recreation and stuff, but again, that's kind of discretionary stuff um, for a lot of people, and so kind of staying away from big ticket discretionary items just till we see kind of uh, how interest rates and the economy play out. So again, I don't time stock market based off that and whether I'm not or not I'm gonna own stocks, but I do think about 
what the future for companies could look like in different environments. And I want to own the companies that I think give me the best opportunity uh, to adapt and basically grow with the economy, help grow the economy. That's why I own a lot of technology stocks. LCI, don't own it. Lowe's, own it. Uh, I mean, this this thing is, so it even when this Lowe's is expensive, I'll probably be looking to add because Lowe's and Home Depot, um, if housing does great, it'll be good for them. If housing doesn't do great and people stay in their houses longer, they're going to do just as well because then people are going to spend you know money renovating and updating or just maintaining um, their homes. But uh, right now, it looks like a pretty decent opportunity. So um, through 2023, even back down to its you know uh, fair value price to earnings ratio of 17 based off growth, uh, you're looking at 11% return. It's been a market beater since 2009, which is awesome. 20% versus 15% the S&P 500. And if we go out a couple years to 2025, which you know pretty reliable company, it is possible like to get an idea of the forecast of this company out that far um, at, at 15, which is b- below the 17.5 that is at now, you're looking at a, almost an 8% annualized return. Uh, 16.5 is an 11.22% return. And then 18, which is you know probably a little high, wouldn't it really expect it as a 14.5. So Lowe's isn't gonna absolutely you know have crazy capital return from here, but it's it's hard to find as reliable and solid of a company Um, That has been a market beater over time. Um, And I think that's it for, oh, MasterCard. So um, I own MasterCard, not looking to add here just because it is looking a little pricey, even though it's got an amazing business model and competitive advantage. Um, It's looking a little pricey, so especially when we don't know what's going to happen with spending and credit card transactions over the short term. Um, Certainly not selling it because over the long term, uh, you know, pretty pretty comfortable with it and and it's not like I can picture a world where this company goes out of business anytime soon Um, and they've absolutely destroyed the market over time this is wrong but still a 24% annualized return over the past 12 years is pretty dang good Um, so I'm holding MasterCard not looking to add to it Masco don't own it Metafast don't own it MGA Magna International this is one I'm considering owning. And again, I'm not going to own all of these or buy all of these that I'm saying look like good opportunities. Um, I'll, I'll probably add to three or four positions with the monthly contributions. Um, and I'll highlight that again on, on Wednesday, the 30th. Um, but uh, this thing pays a 2.8% dividend yield annualized return if they hit these estimates and it trades at a price to earnings ratio of 10, which is about its average, looking at 23% a year for the next two years, so through 2023. If we forecast that out, even if it trades at 11 in 2024 and they hit kind of these expected earnings, which not guaranteed for sure, um, but you're looking at a 27% annualized return. This company has done well, Pretty sure that has beat the market since 2010. Not 100% sure, but it either has or it's close. Um, and they've grown the dividend from five cents a share in 2009 to $1.72, which is an average growth rate of 59% um, or a 34% compound annualized growth rate, which is pretty dang good. And so, haven't talked about this yet, but um, there's a pretty awesome chart here. So it shows the the yield on cost. So if you would have bought in 2009 and, and you know where shares were and, and then gotten the dividend of five cents back then and you held through now, well, now, based on the share price it was back then, which I guess it was $12 and now it's $63 or $12.65, the yield that you're getting on the shares you bought back in 2009 are 13.6%. And that is the magic of dividend growth. Um, so if you buy the shares today, you're getting you know, a 2.83% dividend growth rate. But if you had bought shares uh, in 2009, then the current dividend is 13.6% of the share price that you paid back then, which is pretty awesome. Um, that's why I like dividend growth stocks. 
3M. 3M is not a dividend growth stock, but every once in a while this thing gets gets cheap. So you can see over the past you know 12 years it's traded actually at a, a premium to the uh, a price range of 15. So it's traded up near 18 or 19 um, with 6% annualized earnings growth. And it looks like it's set to kind of keep that 6% or so. So even if it trades um, at a PE of 15, which is below where it has traditionally traded, you're looking at an annualized return of uh, 9.7. It gets up to um, 18 or 19, you're looking at an annualized return of 24. Um, there's a lot of controversy there. There's a lot of um, lawsuits out against 3M right now, which is why this thing has traded down so much. And it's it's why I own it right now. And it's, it's on the list of things I'm considering buying because when this has happened in the past, you can see, so um, traded, uh, you know, got a little bit pricey and then traded back down to a PE of 19. This is back in 2015. And even if we take it out to 2018, um, just the same average PE ratio, not counting any of this, this, not owning it when it was at this like crazy PE ratio, you would have gotten a 12.5% uh, annualized return. And so when this thing drops down and, and just like it did, so this is post COVID, um, you know, when it dropped down to fair value, incredible return um, from, 327 to 116 which is kind of a crazy period right not expecting that but anyways history shows that when this thing gets down to fair value the returns can be pretty good so this hey this was before the crazy covid stuff and you know even from 12 14 2012 when it got down to a pe of 15 to 12 6 2013 um, to a pe of 19 it uh you got a 43 percent annualized return that's pretty awesome for a pretty stable dividend company um a lot of Liabilities and unknowns with 3M, but um, I, I like it as a position to own right now. Merck, don't own it. Don't own it. Don't own this. These skip through Raytheon. Uh, not going to be adding to Raytheon. It's it's a solid company in the um, defense industry, so keeping it. Shoe Carnival. Uh, I don't think there's any chance I could ever own this thing just because of the type of company it is. And it's kind of skipping through. I don't want to waste time on things. Okay, so that's the dividend side. Let's jump over to growth. This is a long video. Is anybody even watching? I don't know. Um, all right, going to move quick with these. So I, I, I own pretty much everything in here, um, but I'm only going to really cover the ones that I'm, I'm considering adding to. So Adobe, great company. Um, Amazon got the position. Uh, not going to add to it. Coinbase, I own it, but I'm also going to be, it's it's a decent sized position in the portfolio now, about 4%, I think. But because I'm going to have exposure to crypto ETFs, uh, not as concerned with growing that Coinbase position or adding to it, just going to let the stock do what it does um, and then get more crypto exposure through those, those ETFs. Salesforce. So Salesforce is a company that has traded at a... Um, a normalized PE ratio of um, 82, which is kind of insane over the past 12 years. Um, and so let's go down to price of sales just because it's, um, it's probably not a perfect way to measure this company, but if we're measuring price of sales against itself over time and um, gross margins have stayed relatively um, close or will stay kind of close to where that it's a decent metric to use um, so over time um, the sales growth has been 21 percent over the past 14 years it's traded at a normalized price sales ratio of um, seven percent with uh, 21 percent annualized sales growth so that's over this whole period their sales are a lot higher now so it's going to be tough to keep growing at 21 percent so let's look a little bit more recently and sales growth has been 18% over uh, since 2016. And so then if we zoom in, um, 2018 it was 20%, 2019 it was 20%, um, 2020, which it gets a little weird with COVID, 17%, 21%, 14%, 19%, back up to expected 20%. Um, and this is 
revenue growth per share. So it takes into account um, if the company is issuing or buying back shares. So if you see these revenue growth numbers different from um, either their directly from their earnings pages or uh, other uh, data aggregators out there, that's why it's different is, is fast graphs does it um, revenue per share, which I actually like because it, it helps compensate some of the, sometimes these tech companies pay a lot of stock based compensation or issue a lot of shares to in that dilutes uh, the current the current shareholders um, and so this takes a lot of that out and and does it um, revenue per share which I, I really like so uh, anyways if if we think about um, I think they're gonna their sales growth is gonna slow law of large numbers and so it may not deserve the same price to sales ratio that it's had historically. So we know, based off this, that it, historically they've uh, they've had a price to sales ratio of um, 8.6. So if we go into here, this is why I again why I love this tool. Um, even at a price to sales ratio of 5.8, which is down from here, it's at about 7.5 here. You're looking at an annualized return of 7.8 percent. And so if you're looking at um, you know six. 6.6 6, that's a 13 percent annualized return uh, 7.4 you're looking at a 17 percent annualized return so I like Salesforce from a risk reward basis here for the quality company that um, you know you're getting through something like a Salesforce uh, if we're looking at um, tech SaaS growth bucket stocks um, so that's uh, it's been about a 21 percent returner on average compound growth since 2017 but if we go back more even better um, to 25 percent and if we go back to 2011 18 percent versus 30 so it beats the S&P 500 over almost every time frame um, or actually yeah just about every time frame except recently it's gotten crushed um, which is why it's interesting because it was way expensive and now it's come back down here Datadog uh, own it uh, probably not adding to this thing and, and not looking to add to it just because it is trading at a 41 price to sales ratio but some pretty strong expected sales growth so maybe it turns out fine um, but I want to wait and see uh, I own my shares not gonna sell them but gonna wait and see um, if this thing gets any any cheaper and I just think there's better opportunities that don't require as perfect of execution as Datadog is set up for and one of those is DigitalOcean so uh, we just showed Datadog at a a blended price sales ratio of 41 without to 2024. It's expected to have 40% um, revenue growth per share. So um, DigitalOcean is trading at a blended price sales ratio of 13 instead of 41. So it's what, I don't know, 3x lower. Um, or what 60 70 percent lower and then um, DigitalOcean is, is expected to be growing earnings or sales at 31 percent in 2024 so uh, Datadog was 40 percent this is 31 percent but even to a PE ratio or a price to sales ratio of 20 which I think is a little high you're looking at a 51 percent return so if we go to uh, annualized return so if we go to forecasting, we can look at a price to sales ratio of 10, which I think is more realistic for a, <laughs> some range of normal in these, in these uh, even these fast growing SaaS and tech companies. But even at a price sales ratio of 10, you're looking at an annualized rate of return of 18%. Again, let's just jump back to Datadog, right? And so if we go, if we go down to, if we go to 19, you're looking at 3.87%, that's, that's almost the double the multiple um, and you're looking at a 4% return versus a 18% return. So um, um, DigitalOcean is certainly at the top of my list to you know continue building. Uh, not going to talk about Google. Everybody knows the Google. Um, HashiCorp. Um, need to do a little bit more work on this thing before I talk about it much publicly. It does look potentially decent but again pretty high price sales ratio 
for again that 31 percent growth like just from that perspective why not own something like like a digital ocean um hubspot it's very solid company has beat the market by a lot uh 45 percent to 13 percent but um expected to grow sales at 30 percent 27 percent and then 23 percent and it's so you're looking at a 10 percent um annualized return if it gets down to a PE ratio of 10 um but probably gonna just hold off on this thing it's not at the top of my list i own it but not at the top of my list to buy more uh mongo database great company a little bit pricey not at the top of my list right now mercado libre is at the top of my list can't measure it um you know apples to apples against these SaaS companies because their gross margins are a lot lower but we can measure it against its own price sales multiple um just to be quick uh, there's other ways to, to um, that are probably a better multiple to look at of, of how to measure this company, like off of um, gross uh, merchandise value. You also have to look at gross margins. Um, but for now, we'll do we'll do price sales, and it's historically traded at a price sales ratio of 10. Right now, it's at 7.6, which is the lowest it's really traded. Minus, you know, even even down. <laughs> Even down in uh, kind of the COVID bottom, it traded at eight, which is kind of crazy that it's it's down lower than that right now. Um, but anyways, the last time it traded at a price sales ratio this low, at least off the you know quick quick math was 2016, and from 2016 to today, 45% annualized return. Um, so that's that's trading that's n- with no multiple growth. So that's a the same price sales ratio that it traded at essentially in 2016 to 2022, you're looking at a 45% return. If you look at, you know, when the multiple expanded, if we just go, let's not go anything crazy. I'm looking for like a price sales multiple of 10. So here we go. We'll go from seven to 10. My dots aren't clicking. Forty-seven percent return. So, anyways, um, looks like it's a decent opportunity to to buy some Mercado Libre if it's the type of company that you're interested in, which I am. Um, even if we go out, and this is based off you know estimates for sales growth, but even if it trades at a five point six and it hits these numbers, so. 35%, 33%, and 30%. Uh, you'd still be looking at an annualized return of 18% if it traded down from a 7.6 price sales, which is a multi, multi year low, down to 5.6. So, pretty decent opportunity to buy some Mercado Libre. Monday um, doesn't have a long history. This thing is expected to grow um, sales at uh, 4%. 35% and then 50%. So you're looking at a, a potential 50% grow, which I don't know, that number could be kind of off. So we'll actually just go to 2023. Um, even if it trades down, or so it's at a price to sales ratio of 14, but trading at 35%, it seems like a, a price to sales ratio of 15 could be reasonable. You're gonna have a 20% annualized return uh, over the next two years. Um, They've got a lot of competition, but but things are looking good for this company. And, and again, I'll go into more detail when I actually share what I'm buying and why I'm buying it, where I can go individual level. But um, opportunity looks pretty good in Monday.com over the next several years. And I think I think really, you know, we'll call it at that. This video is super long, and it's it's probably going to do horribly on the whole YouTube algorithm. So, um, anyways. That's that. I'm Austin Lieberman. I hope you enjoyed this video. I wanted to, sh- I'm through this project. I'm going to share the process, the research, how I'm thinking about it, and the returns, all the transactions of growing this ten thousand dollar portfolio, hopefully to a million dollars over ten years. I hope it's something that people like me that want to learn to invest and not have daily hot stock trade tips, but um, want to work real jobs, enjoy time with their family, um, and just invest over time and in fast growing, exciting companies. Um, I hope that this is interesting to you and more interesting than some of the other stuff that's out there. So you can find me on Twitter at 
Lieberman Austin, my newsletter, austin.substack.com, common stock, commonstock.com forward slash Austin. Um, really appreciate if you like this video, subscribe to this channel, share it with your friends, share it with your grandma, um, and subscribe to my email newsletter and then check common stock out too. And let me know in the comments um, if there's anything you want me to cover, uh, investing lessons, fundamentals, some of these different ratios and multiples, price earnings, price sales. Let me know what you're looking for and, and I'll try to build that into this schedule here. Um, thanks for watching. Have a great day. Take care of your minds, your bodies, and your families because that stuff becomes, this finance helps with all of that. But those things, in my opinion, what's life without health, without um, your mental health, physical health, and without family or people you care about, all this money stuff, like what's the point? Warren Buffett is one of the richest people in the world and he's I don't know, 90 or 93 or something like that. Uh, I would much rather live the life I'm living now with a one thousandth of a percent of his wealth or whatever uh, than trade places with him. Not to go on a tangent, but uh, your health, your mind, your mental health, your physical health, your family, all of that stuff matters. So focus on that too, not just these crazy YouTube channels. Thanks.